Welcome to Tough Talk. Tough Talk is an interview series where I wear this hat and ask smart people tough questions. Tough questions <laughs> about career and growth, personal growth, tough questions about being a founder. Um, and Sashi, we could be more excited that you're here. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to chat with you. My first question for you, um, you've been the, the founder and CEO of Two Drops for almost six years now, um, but before you were at eBay. And I'm curious, did your experience at eBay, if at all, um, prepare you for launching a startup? There's parts of it that did. And the parts of it that did were when you work in a pretty large organization, you, there are so many stakeholders, you know, you are kind of part of, I was part of, well, I, I was in many departments at eBay, but I first started in the research team and you have internal clients, uh, you have your manager, um, you have the data team you're working with. So there's a lot of different groups that you're kind of managing and managing the personalities of. And I feel that carries through when you are working kind of in a startup environment where you have a lot of different stakeholders. Mm. Um, and so that was, um, that was also, that was something that was similar. I, I also think that it prepared me for a startup in realizing the things I did not want to do and the things that bog an organization down. And when you're in a large organization, you really see all of the inefficiencies and how people are making duplicative efforts on the same thing. And there's no true owner of something to actually push an initiative forward. There's so many layers in politics. And um, that made me very cognizant that, wow, I actually like don't like that environment. Um, and if I were to do it differently, you know, this is how I want to organize um, a team. And I'm not saying that's always feasible because as you grow, it just becomes more and more complicated. So it's natural that in evolution of an organization, there are going to, lines are going to get blurrier and there's going to be a lot of layers, but at least um, I could take that and know how I wanted to first create my team and, and the, and the organization structure. It's interesting though, because you kind of, before I started tough, well, like three jobs before tough. I was in more of a corporate environment and you go from almost being like over-resourced and that's why like there's multiple people working on the same things and can get a little political because it's like who who should own this um, to being though like very under-resourced quickly. Yes. And, and <laughs> so right. how did you handle it? Like did you hire immediately or did you kind of stay solo for a while and then get your initial team together? No, I was solo for a while, but I always had, you know, interns or help. And I think you're right. I mean, that's a great way to describe it over from over resource to truly under resource. And I was doing everything from making the tea in my kitchen to packaging it, to shipping it out, to doing these retail shows, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. And I actually didn't, I, so I had interns along the way for the first year and I took my mom out of retirement, pulled her up. I was living <laughs> up uh, in Northern California, moved her up from Southern California, Northern California to help me. Um, and she did that. And I'm so grateful. So that, that transition took place, but I actually didn't make my first real significant full-time hire until about a year and a half in. Um, and that was really just trying to figure out what was the right path for us. I'd actually had no experience in food manufacturing or what it entailed, what the tra channels were that were going to work for us. And that mm -hmm. took a little bit of time to figure out. And also I didn't have the resources at the time to yeah. hire someone full time. Mm -hmm. um, my first hire was my sister. <laughs> so similar. <laughs> you have to wrangle the, the family yes. members that you can. Um, yeah. But I know like from my experience for tough, um, when, when we first hired, I made a lot of hiring mistakes. I didn't really know like the type of team that we needed and the characteristics to look for. And that took some time and some growing pains. And um, I'm curious, how did you think about the first hire? Like what position did you feel like was that like really important for that role? So I had, um, it wasn't a straight path of like instantly hiring the right person for that role. I just mm -hmm. took a, a stock of, took stock of what I liked doing and what I think I was naturally good at versus what I didn't want to be 
um, bogged down doing. And so for me, that was operations. Like I just logistics and operations. I just did not want to manage. So I always tried to hire, um, I hired basically a junior operations manager. She was just out of college to help. And, and I knew that she necessarily wasn't going to stay forever, but Mm -hmm. that we could get to a certain milestone. Um, and the milestone would just open up opportunities, whether I wanted to raise money or I wanted to scale the business in a different way. So the greatest analogy I heard about hiring and what I heard from another founder at that time, he was in his fifties or sixties, but he had multiple startups under his belt. He's, he's like, cause you know, it's like a big thing. I'm sure you realize when you first hire someone, you're like, Whoa, like, what does that mean? And like, you want to do things right. You also mm-hmm. want to make sure that you're not letting them down if you have to let them go or something happens. So he was really great at just saying, you have to look at hiring and your team like a party bus and the party bus is going a direction. It's going to whatever, multiple clubs, maybe one club, but people get on the bus. They like add a lot to it. They might have drinks with you and party with you, but then at some point they might get tired or fatigued. They want to get off the bus. <laughs> and that goes on and on and on, right. As, as the bus continues, but you have to be grateful that they came on the bus and made the party what it was for the time that they were there. And so mm-hmm. once you kind of adopt that type of mentality, you're like, okay, well it's a give and take and this is going to happen. So she, I kind of realized she would get us to a certain point. And then at that time is when I made a really significant hire, which is our now COO um, to mm-hmm. just manage all of operations. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I like the idea of milestone. Cause I think um, in any like growth trajectory, like um, at least for tough, I've always thought about like our business is kind of like stair stepped. Like we mm-hmm. we did something until we didn't have to do it anymore to get to a certain place. It kind of feels similar to that. But I feel like a milestone for some reason in my brain feels a little bit better. Like a stair step feels like you're you're pushing something down to get up, yeah. you know. But it's not really like that. You're not. Um, just because you had to do one thing to get somewhere, it doesn't always mean it was like a bad thing. It, it was just like yeah. where you're at at that time. Yeah. And I think you just realize like, okay, this is what I kind of have to do. I have to suck it up. You're going to deal with things like, all right, this, you have to realize, you know, maybe the constraints of certain hires you make, like, all right, but you kind of have to tolerate it until you can get to that next phase. I know, but you can never get off the party bus. How I know. do you deal with that? You're, you're, you're permanent party buser permanent resident on the bus but I also feel like that's when you have to take breaks like get off the road maybe recharge and then resume driving yeah Yeah. fix the flat tire restock the bar (laughs) restock the bar clean you know do a nice little cleaning of the bus outside the bus one thing that is hard for me to wrap my head around is I read that um it took five years to get the patent for two drops issued Um, yeah how did you deal with that? It's a very long time. Um, time and money is kind of what the secret sauce is there. Uh, there's no magic <laughs> formula. Although I will say like, I learned a lot around just who to hire your first, you know, counsel, account, well, counsel you go to is not necessarily who will end up, you know, um, pushing it forward. So I think there was just a lot of learning on my end. Like I didn't, obviously it's not common. You like, don't just get patents all the time. So the whole process of knowing like what the steps were also what the opposition was and um counter arguments were whenever we would receive a rejection i would have to just like look it over and really understand well why are you know what's going on here and then read other patents and see like what what the gaps were so i think part of it's a learning curve part of it though is really having the right counsel and i think i spent i like spent a lot of time and we spent a lot of time and money on just maybe not having the strongest counsel and but you don't know what you don't know at the time so once mm-hmm. i kind of realized that we switch gears um then that's when i really started seeing the momentum and being like okay this is like it's very clear what we have to overcome and do i have faith in the counsel or argument to really push this forward and so mm-hmm. um that's it's just kind of learning as you go i but then i talked to other other patent holders and on average it does take about four years Mm, that feels better i'm guessing yeah Yeah. if i knew that (laughs) not sure we would have gone this route but here we are (laughs) um i'm curious um i saw a couple of months ago you were hiring for a retention manager and i'm Mm -hmm. curious kind of like at your stage um 
when you're thinking about LTV and you're thinking about um, like not just like getting all these customers into this like leaky bucket, obviously retention is so critical, but how do you think about balancing um, growth for the company as you prioritize across like getting the right new customers in the door while retaining the ones that you already have? Like how do you balance acquisition and retention for T-Drops? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's like truly the tension that you're always focused on, that balance. Um, I think last year was a great year of proving out certain retention metrics. Now, again, like you're always monitoring it because every cohort is so different. And so um, we hired a head of retention and also retention manager to purely focus on that aspect of the business. Um, so it's definitely an investment that's that's like critical for us. Cause if we don't solve for that, then we really can't afford to spend on the acquisition side. Mm-hmm. So I think it, I mean, we don't have it perfectly sound. I think we're, 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 um, you know, there are milestones that we want to meet to get to a certain retention goal, retention number, mm-hmm. but more and more as we're seeing that promise happen and um, that's something we, like we literally monitor on a daily, if not weekly basis, then that gives us more confidence, right. To, to, um, to accelerate spend on the acquisition side. I think mm-hmm. what's been most challenging this past year is that there are rising costs across the board, um, on the acquisition side, on the supply chain sh- side, which is our shrinking our margins. So there's not a lot of room to play with. Like you don't have a lot of room to really make that mistake. And mm-hmm, that's been mm-hmm. the hardest part. So there's there's been points this year even where we've halted spend altogether because we're just like, we need to, like this is even in the best case scenario of like increased retention and a stronger LTV, we still can't justify the spend. So mm-hmm, we've, mm-hmm. we've had to pull back and then go forward, pull back and go forward. So I don't know if that ever goes away. Maybe you, you probably have a better perspective on what happens as, as your organization grows, but that is truly like something we're always balancing and pacing. You know, we, that's how we do that pacing sheet with you. Cause like week over week, we're just managing that balance. Mm-hmm. Speaking of pacing, mm-hmm. I do have a question. Uh, you completed a marathon in 2013. Do you still run or were you kind of like one and done? Mm-hmm. I did a couple, I did like the Nike half, uh, mar- I did a couple half marathons after that. And mm-hmm. I think that was more of a mental leap for me to, cause I always like told myself, I hate running. I hate running. I hate running. <laughs> Cardio was like the thing I was my least favorite in terms of working out. And so part of that was just getting over that mental like story and narrative for me. And, mm-hmm. um, I think by doing a couple, like three or four marathons, not all, they, they weren't full. That was my only full one. But by doing that, I think I, I overcame that um, mental setback. And then once I did that, I was like, okay, I don't need to continue running like 13 and a half miles at a time. Like I can calm down. Yeah. Did you, um, listen to music or was it like calm headspace and you just got to kind of like be with your own thoughts? Um, music really helped me to kind of get in the, in the zone, but on the actual marathon day, I didn't use music. I just, um, there was like, I, I don't know. It just, I think I was, there was a certain rhythm I, I got into. Um, and I wouldn't say it felt effortless. That's the wrong <laughs> statement, but there was a certain, on the actual race day, there was like a certain momentum because I had trained right for like four or five months prior. Um, there was a certain rhythm and there was like, I finally understood what people meant by a runner's high. I never experienced that before, but like, I mm-hmm. finally understood that. Uh, it didn't last the whole time. The last like mile and a half, I think was like, I almost gave up. Um, but mm-hmm. yeah. Is, is there like, uh, do you feel like on your list somewhere in the future, there's like, um, another type of like physical challenge or mental, I mean, but running a marathon is both mental and physical, but like, is there kind of like that next activity or sport or, um, kind of goal that you have outside of running? Um, I can't say there is, I will say that I'm right now, like, um, very appropriately matched with like my partner, Gabe is like an avid outdoors person and like Mm. adventurer. So, um, that is not my natural state, but I am put in a lot of different scenarios now 
whether mm. it's like hiking, climbing, et cetera, that are definitely filling that bucket, like mm. that need Good. for um, physical and mental toughness. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's my space adventure, okay. you know, living in the mountains and I, like, I'm like, oh skiing and biking and hiking. It's yeah. Yeah. It's, but, um, I, I liked this was somebody was talking about you on LinkedIn and they just described like driven, focused, hardworking individual who simply won't take no for an answer in the best possible way. And I'm mm -hmm. curious, is, is this how you see yourself? And did you like get to a point of that level of confidence? Um, or like, have you always had that? Or do you feel like that, that kind of like grew as you progressed through your career? Um, yeah, I still don't feel like I'm always there. Like, I think that there's different levels and there's at different times at which you have these um, spurts of enlightenment or something clicks in you and you are just driven, you go. Um, but that's not always the case. So like there's different, uh, I would say that there's, there's aspects of my business that I feel really confident in. And then there are times when I don't have that, I have to cultivate it. But mm -hmm. I think what, what is my superpower is like the ability to just cultivate something and work on it, you know? Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And for me, a big one in that area was like raising capital, which I just never done before. It was very like during the headlights, didn't know anything about it, but through time and effort, just cultivating that confidence to do it and then cultivating confidence in my business and, you know, um, working at it. So I guess a long way of answering your question, but it's not natural for me at times, but mm -hmm. there are spurts of like, I can do this. And if I don't, if I don't have that, I have the ability to cultivate them. Mm -hmm. When you talk about cultivating, um, do you have like a go-to, like, do you read more or you just jump into the deep end or you ask people who have been in similar situations, like what's your way to kind of like gather information when you're in the thick of it? Um, I rely a lot on asking around and um, I, especially in my space, like the founder community is like a huge resource for me in times of uncertainty. Um, and so I rely on them for emotional support and strength and also just knowledge, you know, like, how do I approach this? Um, in fact, we found you guys, we found tough because we, um, were, you know, asking around, have a great relationship with another founder and, um, she made the introduction. Now we're here mm -hmm. on a Friday afternoon. Exactly. Speaking of which, what are your Friday plans? Do you have good ones? Um, this weekend I'm going apple picking, <laughs> which is, um, fun and a new relaxing activity. And, um, yeah, tomorrow I'm just going to recharge. I feel like it's always go, go, go over like mentally go, go, go. And I just want uh, a day of rest. So I live, I'm very lucky. I live, um, like a block from the beach. So I might dip in the ocean or something this weekend. I'm curious, like, um, as a remote team at Tough, we've been chatting internally as team members around, like, uh, finding, especially during the holiday season, finding opportunities during the work day or during the work week to recharge. Do you have any, like, specific strategies or things that work for you? Or have you been kind of, like, helping your team with that at all? Um, I don't know if I've been as great as helping the team out. I think off the bat, um, there's a lot of understanding and flexibility on the team. So obviously being remote, um, offering now we have more comprehensive mental health, uh, resources for the team. Mm -hmm. And we actually transitioned our, um, basically our health providers. And then also our, um, oh my God, I'm losing the name of what our HR platform to really service mm -hmm. that need. Cool. Um, and so that's been, that's been good. I think for me personally, I really have during the pandemic and with everything turning remote have leaned into a more balanced life. And mm -hmm. part of moving to where I am now was, was part of that decision, making sure I walk every day, like just get outside every day mm -hmm. was part of that decision. Um, really trying to turn things off at a certain hour has been part of that decision. Um, and just incorporating more meditation and, um, yeah, just like, uh, just leaving space, I think is the big one. Cause I think it's easier mm -hmm. to fill your day all the time, but to actually 
pull away and and have less in your day is actually the hard part. It's really hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Finishing your to-do list and not feeling the urge to add to it because you got it done, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. My uh, last question for you, um, if tea didn't exist, what would you be doing in the world? Road not taken. My God, people ask that all the time. I honestly, <laughs> I don't have a good answer for that. If people I, ask all the time, you need to come up with something. You just make something up. <laughs> I know. I, I think... Um, I'm like, I, I would, I was like, I was like, maybe I do something in the nonprofit space, but then I'm like mm -hmm. of inefficiency and some organizations kills me. So yeah, yeah. that's going to be the route. I honestly don't Professional know. Professional marathon runner. Absolutely not. No, no. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I could do that either. I, I feel like somebody just set a record though for like, Have um, you like done many. Have you done a lot? <laughs> no, I've done a lot of half marathons. I did one marathon. I did the, the Chicago marathon, which was very fun because like the whole city comes out, you know, so you kind of feel like you're yeah. in a parade. Um, Is that a qualifying so, one? No, that's awesome. Yeah, okay. I was like, I, I have no idea. But um, it's been a very long time since I ran. Now I do a lot more on the bike, but yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, so I mean, thank you so much for joining. It was amazing get, yeah, getting thanks. to chat. Yeah. Yeah, you too. Thank you so much. Um, enjoy apple picking.